Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera Finally we reach the final week Week 14 And the final chapter in the whole syllabus That is volumetric analysis And this is the second classical method Beside the gravimetric method The first gravimetric is by weight And volumetric analysis is determination of our analyte by Volume by titration Now, in any volumetric analysis, uh, a technique in which the volume of the material needed to react with the analyte is measured. So, it's a typical, anything that you normally do during a titration. Okay. So, uh, the first requirement they put it, exact volumetric measurement of analyte and reagent solution. So, we are using volumetric plus and all transfer of solution must be carried out accurately by the use of pipette. Okay, and volumetric plus is to, is to uh, prepare all the solutions. So make sure that we use the correct apparatus uh, for the transfer and for the using volumetric plus for making up solution. And then we make the titration. So from a burette and accurately reading the burette to two decimal places. And then calculate the concentration of analyte MA VA over A equal to MB, VB over B. So that is basically the, all the volumetric analysis that we are, especially for what we, has, we are fami familiar with, that is the acid-base titration. And basically the titration is we add a certain standard, okay, your titan, from a burette into the conical flask. So why use conical flask? But that when we are stirring it, uh, shaking it uh, so none of the analyte will be none of the solution will uh, be splashed out so that's why we use a conical flask okay uh, so we will add the titrant to our sample or our solution containing our analyte until the reaction is complete and normally by the shown uh, by uh, a change in color of the indicator Okay, type of titration. So there is acid-based titration. We will do it uh, in this chapter. Some example of precipitation titration. Argentometric, meaning that we are using uh, argentum silver as our titran. Oxidation reduction, without titration, we will not be involved. And then a, comp uh, a sample, a uh, an example of complexometric titration using EDTA. Okay, the normal apparatus for doing the titration. So titrating from bullet into a into a conical flask, and in this case we have a magnetic stirrer, so we do not have to shake it. Instead, while releasing the uh, while doing the titration, the it is automatic automatically being stirred by the magnetic stirrer. If you look on the right, there is also the auto titrator. Okay, mostly are automated and then all the apparatus using uh, for titration the volumetric flask and the pipette and if you can observe over here okay so these are examples of the micro pipette to inject or to transfer small volume of solution Okay, let's go to uh, some of the general terms uh, being used. So the titrant, the uh, substance or reagent solution, you add in the burette and you will add it over to the analyte. Okay, so under normal circumstances, the analyte that you are being anal you are analyzing uh, normally is being put into the uh, conical flask. But certainly, it's not that uh, it's not something which is uh, we must do it. No, no. Sometimes the analyte can also be in the burette, but seldom. So, under normal circumstances, we will always put our analyte in the conical flask. Okay, and then there is an equivalent point. So, equivalence point is where the mole of your analyte is equal to the mole of your titrant. Okay, the mole of your analyte is equal to the mole of titrant. 
meaning that there is none left of your analyte in the solution okay in the conical flask all your analyte had already been titrated been reacted with the titrant so mole of analyte is mole of titrant but without any change in color okay that change in color that change in color is being represented by what we call as end point point at which there is a sudden physical change okay an indicator color changes used to measure the equivalent point now the end point is exactly one drop after the equivalence point so at the equivalence point as mentioned there is no change in color but at that time at that time all the analyte had already been reacted with your titrant so the next drop of your titrant would then react with your indicator so the indicator will then change if it is an acid base reaction it will have the color of acid changes over to the color of base okay so at the end point the drop would react with the indicator and cause the changes from the color from acid to base or base to acid so that's the reason why end point is one drop after the equivalence point and it is being represented by a change of color so indicator is a compound having a physical property that changes abruptly at the end point okay at the end point so meaning that uh, most of it is a uh, color changes can be uh, easily observed acid base phenylphthalate is example of indicator so so meaning that if you have in your conical flask there must always be your analyte and your indicator titration error difference between the observed end point and the true equivalence point okay and then there is a blank titration you are titrating uh, you are titrating a blank the normal blank that we are uh, used to okay and then there's the term primary standard uh, this is a new term a pure stable reagent used directly as a standard concentration calculated on the actual weight and volume of solution okay a pure stable reagent okay uh, there are very few primary standard example of primary standard i will say now we'll go later uh, is sodium carbonate sodium carbonate is a pure stable reagent so it's called a primary standard so uh, what is meant by primary standard is easy so if you were to make the calculation of molarity okay molarity you waste certain amount of sodium carbonate okay and then you transfer to it a volumetric flask and you dissolve it and make up the volume and for example you calculated the uh, the concentration in molar mole per liter equal to 0.25 molar so for a primary standard it is exactly 0.25 molar but for something that is not a primary standard for example edta if you make the same weight that will be calculated to be 0.25 molar the, con the real concentration is not 0.25 molar it will say around 0.25 molar can you see the difference for a primary standard sodium carbonate you weigh and then you make the solution and based on the calculation that is the concentration exact concentration but a non-primary standard example edta when you make the uh, calculation similar calculation and it should give you 0.25 molar but in actuality it's not 0.25 molar it's around 0.25 molar because it's not a primary standard 
So how do you want to know the, the real concentration of EDTA? Then you have to undergo the process of standardization. So the EDTA solution that you prepare must be titrated against the primary standard. Example, sodium carbonate just now. And after that calculation, based on MAVA over A, MAVB, MBVB over B, based on that calculation, you'll get the, con the real concentration of EDTA. So this process, the process of determining the concentration of a secondary standard, not a primary standard, a secondary standard, EDTA, by titrating with a primary standard, sodium carbonate. So the whole process is called the process of standardization. So this is a real difference between primary standard and secondary standard. Primary standard, you get the exact concentration, whereas the secondary standard, you must undergo the process of standardization to get the true or, or the exact concentration of a secondary, prime, secondary standard. Okay, uh, and then the standard solution, I think, goes back to the normal definition, a solution of known concentration. Okay, a standard solution is a solution of known concentration. Direct titration where the analyte is directly treated with the titrate. HCl titrate again, uh, sodium hydroxide. So that is example of direct titration and you know the concentration of your analyte by using the uh, formula MAVA over A equal to MBVB over B. And then there is a back titration. Now this is new. Let me give examples. Okay, you want to buy a pen and the pen you do not know the price, but you know that it will be less than 10 ringgit. Okay, so you give the shopkeeper a 10 ringgit and then he return to you 4 ringgit. So what is the cost of the pen? 10 ringgit minus the excess that he gave back to you, 4 ringgit. So the cost of pen 10 minus 4 equal to 6 ringgit. So this is basically what is a back titration. So you add an excess of standard reagent to react with the analyte. Uh, why we do actually back titration? Because the reaction is quite slow. Okay, it's, it's a slow reaction, for example. So you add this reagent in excess and slowly it will react with the analyte. And then, you know that there must be some excess uh, of the reagent which is not reacted. So you titrate, you want to know the amount, so you titrate that with a second titrate. Okay, and finally you know what is the amount of unreacted uh, reagent. So you add an excess of standard reagent minus the unreacted reagent and then you know the amount of reagent that reacted with your analyte so that is basically back titration and in this subject or in this topic we would discuss this using Volhard titration it's a precipitation reaction in Volhard titration in sorry in Volhard as the as the indicator actually Okay, is in precipitation titration. Now, if you have a titration, the plot of a titration curve of pH versus the volume of titran. So, in the example being given over here, so uh, I can know that this is a weak base, weak acid. Sorry. So, by the high pH. It must be a weak acid and this one will also be a weak base so actually this is titration of a weak acid and a weak base now if I were to ask you a question which is the titran which is the analyte in the conical flux <laughs> okay 
which is the title if this is a uh, uh, ammonium hydroxide basis uh, ammonium hydroxide is the base and then the the acid is uh, the HNO2 for example okay nitrous acid weak acid and weak base so which one is the title which one which one is the analyte so look at look at the where the curve started the curve started in the acid range so when we are measuring the ph we are measuring it in the conical flask so easily we can confirm that the acid will be in the conical flask and then the titrant is the weak base now how would i know that this is a weak base and a weak acid by the shape of if i were to draw it i were to sketch it if i were can give you a good sketch uh, okay a good sketch this would be the shape of a strong acid being titrated with a strong base why first you have this sharp inflection point sharp inflection point meaning that the change from here and here is a very sharp so this reflect a strong base and strong acid the first is second is look at the ph started at a low ph meaning that it must be a strong acid strong acid has a low ph where else a strong base would have a very high ph okay so that is the indicator of a strong acid being titrated with a strong base if i were to reverse it a strong base being titrated with a strong acid how would the the graph the curve shows so strong base being titrated with a strong acid so it would start at a strong base and the shape would be like this sorry it will be sharp I, I, I will erase it back Okay, so this would be a strong base titrated with a strong acid. What about if a strong base titrated with a weak acid? Then the same drawing except that you would observe this one to be like this. Okay, so this one would be a strong base being titrated with a weak acid. So these are shapes of the titration curve so depending on which is in the conical flask and which is the titrant and the shape changes accordingly okay so for any uh, titration you need the standard solution okay you need the standard solution and uh, you want to have a known stoichiometric relationship with the with the uh, analyte with the analyte and in the in the solution in the conical plus so you will add the analyte with your indicator and the indicator change must be very clear for example phenolphthalein from colorless to pink in color very distinct change but if you were to have a, an indicator changing color from uh, yellow to blue it's quite difficult to mark when when is the end point so a good clear end point signal is an advantage for that indicator okay now preparation of the standard solution then there is a direct method preparation of the primary standard and then the indirect method standardization method for a secondary method as mentioned just now example for a primary method sodium carbonate whatever being prepared give you by calculation the concentration that is the exact concentration where else for a secondary standard 
when you calculate it that is not the exact concentration but you have to do standardization to know the exact concentration so there will be a two step making the solution and then making a titration against a primary standard to know the real exact concentration of a secondary standard so a direct or primary standard a solid primary standard reagent is weighed and diluted to a known concentration in a volumetric flask and used directly as the titrate okay so uh, you weigh the, the, the amount and then you dilute it or you, you uh, dissolve it in water for example and in a volumetric flask and you make the calculation of the concentration so these are the properties of a primary standard and known chemical formulas, high stability, high purity, all these are the properties of a primary standard. Okay, let's look at, uh, let's look at some examples of primary, primary standard. So just now sodium carbonate, the molecular weight, and then there's a three spot, whatever it is, okay, the name and thumb, the compound being mentioned. Okay, so that is the molecular weight and standard for base titration, uh, potassium hydrogen talat KHP and then KH iodide, potassium hydrogen iodide, benzoic acid. So these are, so these are uh, primary standards. And further examples for precipitation titration, uh, silver nitrate, sodium chloride, uh, potassium dichromate, uh, K, K, potassium iodide sodium oxalate so these are examples of primary standard so there's there's not a lot of primary standard okay so when you prepare the primary standard uh, I keep repeating it okay primary standard prepared by weighing it and then dissolving it and then prepare it in a volumetric flask okay so you will know the concentration to prepare concentration of 0 0.1045 molar. So what do you do? Molarity equal to gram divided by mole divided by liter. Somehow you arrange it. Okay, the, to, get, to get the gram. So gram equal to molarity times liter times molarity times liter times volume. Okay, molarity times volume. Then you get the, the gram. Molarity times liter times formula weight. That's it. Then you'll get the, the volume. Okay, so that's how you make the calculation of a primary standard. And how do you make the calculation of a secondary standard? The first step is similar as the primary standard. You make that calculation. You weigh your, your, your EDTA and then you'll make the solution. But then you have to make the titration against sodium carbonate, for example, to determine the real calculation of EDTA by using the formula MAVA over A, MBVB over B. Okay, so these are things I, I, I believe strongly believe that you have already done it somewhere in your matrix or in your high school. I'm just stating it uh, as a repeat, as a reminder of how calculation are being made and then there is the volumetric calculation preparation of a standard solution uh, so calculate the amount of uh, whatever the standard solution is required to prepare 100 ml uh, 1000 ppm stock solution of aurum in 0.1 normal HCl so this is exactly the same calculation that I gave you last time Calculation of 1000 ppm of uh, magnesium using magnesium foil, if you can remember. And then the same calculation, calculation of 1000 ppm of magnesium, but this time you are using magnesium nitrate. Okay, and then the example again I put forward last time, calculation of 1000 ppm of nitrate using magnesium nitrate if you can remember that calculation that calculation is similar to the calculation being projected over here so 
uh, to calculate that 100 uh, 1000 ppm is weight 1000 milligram and then dilute it with one liter of oh sorry you dilute it in one liter you put in uh, put in your 1000 milligram into a volumetric flask and then you will add water distilled water up to the mark okay so that is 1000 ppm if you want to prepare only 100 ml times by the volume 0.1 liter so you need 100 ml solution contains 100 milligram or but when you are preparing it okay from a salt you must always times it with the ratio of formula weight of your salt AUCL4 divided by formula weight of the AU as, as the same example we say why because when you are weighing you are not weighing pure orum you are weighing it orum plus the chlorine as such the weight is of course very high higher than by the ratio by the ratio given okay i think you should get this because we had already shown the type, this type of calculation so the general titration calculation maba over a and bbb over b and use it so a and b is the coefficient for hcl and sodium hydroxide so the a equal to one the b equal to one but for uh, sodium hydroxide against sulfuric acid so the a is one but the b it will react with two mole of sodium hydroxide so the b equal to okay so a and b is a stoichiometric coefficient based on the coefficient of uh, the titration of the analyte of the of the uh, reactants so these are the examples uh, very simple examples you've gone it many many times before okay using the maba over a and bbb over b between sodium hydroxide and hcl okay we would go to the sample calculation for calculating the ph okay ph of acid ph of bases ph of weak acid and weak bases and buffers uh, but not for salt and I strongly believe that you have the uh, already gone through the calculation while you are studying matriculation or somewhere in form 6 so I would browse through going quite fast because this is uh, in terms of revision and similar calculation will be encountered when we are doing for acid base titration so the pH scale any P, P in chemistry is minus log so for pH minus log H plus for pOH minus log OH minus okay so that is what the term pH negative logarithm of the uh, H plus pOH okay then negative log of the OH minus then all the equation related H plus time OH minus equal to 10 minus 14 okay and then pH plus pOH equal to 14 so that are some of the relationship that we should be used to and the other thing okay you should, can you try it if the concentration is 0 0.2 what is the pH pH equal to minus log 0 0.2 so you will get the pH equal to uh, I think it should be 2 now what about if you are given a pH so pH equal to 9 what would be the concentration of the H plus you are given now pH so you will use the NT log okay use the NT log 10 minus so what you should do then is write the NT log let me put it over here if you can read it 10 minus the pH so pH equal to minus uh, 9 then 10 the antilog minus 9 so that will give you the concentration of H plus so from the value of H plus you should be able to calculate the OH minus 
okay using the relationship h plus time oh minus equal to 10 minus 40 so this basically the relationship and then for a strong acid what's the definition of a strong acid 100% ionized so the arrow should be one week and how do you know that acid is strong i've told you before okay there are few of the inorganic acid hcl h2so4 hno3 hbr hi hclo4 so around six or probably seven of the acids are strong acids the other are weak acid so once you know the strong acid quite easy to remember hcl h2so4 hno3 hi hbr and then hclo4 so from the group of halogen make sure that you understand that hf hf is a weak acid okay hf is not a strong acid hcl hbr hi is a strong acid so make sure you differentiate that okay so sample calculation what is the ph of 0.01 molar hcl so it will dissociate so 0.01 molar will dissociate into 0.01 molar of h plus and 0.01 molar of cl minus so ph minus log h plus equal to 0.01 equal to 2. so this is how we make the calculation very easy so but must first you must identify this is a weak acid or a weak base so for a weak base so you get it poh equal to minus log oh minus so you got it in term of poh then you must convert it back to ph using the relation ph plus poh equal to 40. okay what about if H2SO4? So H2SO4 plus water equal to H3O plus plus Cl minus, right? No. You got 2H plus. 2H plus. So 2 times 0 0.01. Okay. So you must minus it 2, point, uh, 2 times 0 0.01. And you would see that H2SO4 would give you a lower pH, meaning that it is it is a stronger strong acid. Why? Because it contributes more H3O plus into the solution. As such, it will have a lower pH. So that's how we make calculation for strong acid and similarly strong base. Okay, strong base, these are the example for strong base using sodium hydroxide. So you calculate, you got it, uh, the pH, okay, they, they put it, uh, put it uh, in one, one sentence, pH equal to 14 minus pOH. So you calculate the pOH, then you'll get the pH. So similar calculation. So then what is the 100%, uh, what is the strong base? So I told you, okay, uh, the hydroxide of the 1A, 1A group, and the 2A group except the top one, BEOH, BEOH2, okay? So other than that, in the first group and the second group, 1A and 2A, all are strong bases. Now, and then you are given what we term as a weak acid. So it is not completely ionized. So how do you know uh, that this uh, weak acid? You know it because it's not a strong acid. A simple, simple definition. So why is it weak? Because it's not in the list of the strong acid. So acid acetate, whatever the name, HCN, HNO2, uh, HF, so all are weak acid. And the weak acid are being uh, differentiated by having the what we call as the dissociation constant for an acid is ka for a base is kb okay that is dissociation constant so if we compare hcn 
and HNO2 having the value of HCN 4.9 times 10 minus 2 the dissociation constant and for HNO2 4.4 times 10 minus 4 so we can know that both are weak acid why both have the value of Ka HCL is there any value of Ka no K refers to reversible equation where else HCL and all the other strong acids it has only a one way okay so for HCN and HNO2 look at the value so the smaller is the value or the bigger is the negative value the weaker is the weak acid so for example HCN minus 10 HNO2 minus 4 therefore HCN is a weaker weak acid or HNO2 is a stronger weak acid because in the dissociation it will produce more H plus compared to HCN but it's still a weak acid the amount dissociated is small relative to the strong acid okay uh, a weak acid reacts with water to produce the hydrozonium ion h3o plus and the conjugate base okay the conjugate base hcl dissociated into h plus plus cl minus so h plus is the acid hydrozonium ion and then cl minus is the conjugate base of hcl so to know the conjugate base of any acid you minus the h plus from hcl so hcl minus h plus then the product is the conjugate base okay h2so4 h2so4 what is the conjugate base so for conjugate base it will lose one electron so h2so4 when it loses one electron it will produce h plus plus hso4 minus so the conjugate base is hso4 minus that is how we determine the conjugate base of any acid minus one h plus okay look at the equation given a generally acid at ha h is the hydrozonium ion and a is a uh, conjugate base or conjugate uh, conjugate base of the uh, the acid so we find that uh, ka equal to the concentration of the salt or a minus uh, the conjugate base sorry not not the salt conjugate base and then h plus divide by the concentration of ha again repeat it back the concentration is always in molarity if not in molarity you have to convert every concentration must be in the form of molarity so this is how we calculate the uh, ph of weak acid using the value of ka in the next slide once we identify that the acid is not strong it's a weak acid and it's a totally different calculation calculation for strong acid and strong base is quite easy straightforward you know the concentration in molarity ph equal to minus log of the concentration but for a weak acid it's a totally different concentration a uh, different uh, method of calculation okay look at hcn calculate the ph of 0.1 molar hcn and the ka given 4.9 times 10 minus 10 and this is exact uh, really uh, a good indication that hcn is a weak acid because the value of ka is given okay so ka for reversible reaction two way where else for hcl there is no ka value because the reaction is one way okay we make the calculation so ka equal to the concentration of product divided by the concentration of 
reactant. So what's the product? H2O plus Cn minus. What's the reactant? HCN. So equal to, we make the assumption, the amount dissociated from the 0 0.10 is x. So we put x times x divided by 0 0.10 original concentration and the amount that dissociated as x. So 0 0.10 minus x and we got it as x squared divided by 0 0.10 minus x. Now, we can simplify the calculation. Uh, now, by the aid of uh, calculator, it's easy to calculate. Assume that there is no calculator, then we simplify it. And that simplification is quite true. Uh, we assume that the amount 0 0.10 and the amount associated dissociated is extremely small. So 0 0.10 minus x equal to 0 0.10. How could we do it? Look at the value of Ka. The Ka value, 4.9 times 10 minus 10, is just a reflection that around 10 billion molecules of HCN, because of 10 minus 10, 10 billion, only one would dissociate. Okay, only one would dissociate into H2O plus plus Cn minus. So, meaning that the amount dissociated are extremely very small. So, that's why we can make the assumption 0 0.10 minus x approximately 0 0.10. And it simplify the calculation. Put in the value. So, 4.9 times 10 minus 10 equal to x squared divided by 0 0.10. And you find the value of x. So x, 4.9 times 10 minus 6 molar. So that is, what is x then? x is H3O plus, right? So how do you calculate the pH? pH equal to minus log of the x. So minus log 4.9 times 10 minus 6. Let me calculate it for a while. Okay, minus, minus log 4.9 minus 6 and I got it 5.31 so the pH should be 5.31 so that is the pH of 0 0.11 molar HCS okay so this is how we do calculation for a weak acid for a weak base Similar calculation, except that, uh, except that, in a base, the value of Ka being changed to Kb, and a base would dissociate OH minus, so that H3O plus would be replaced by OH minus. Okay, so can we calculate the P? Uh, then we calculate the POH. Okay, rather than the pH, and from the POH we can convert up to pH. Okay, so that's how we calculate for a weak base. Okay, this is the one uh, I mentioned just now. So a weak base, okay, a base plus H2O will produce uh, the conjugate acid of the base, HB plus. So how do you know the conjugate acid? When a base will accept H plus, okay, acid will lose H plus a base will accept H+. plus, So that's why they put it as HB+. plus. That is the base. Plus OH minus and characteristic of base is to produce OH minus. So the dissociation constant is Kb. Kb equal to HB+, plus, the concentration of the conjugate acid. Okay, HB+, plus, plus o, uh, times OH minus, divided by the concentration of the base. And the rest, similar calculation as in your weak acid. Except that, now we are calculating OH minus. So from the OH minus, we calculate the POH. So from the POH, we calculate the pH. Okay, simple calculation should be. And then we are going for the buffer. Okay, what is a buffer? A buffer is a solution that is able to resist changes in pH. 
when limited to a small small addition of acid or small addition of a base so buffers contain it or sorry buffers must be made up of a weak acid or a weak base it cannot be formed from a strong acid or a strong base i repeat myself okay buffer can only be formed from a weak acid and a weak base or a weak base but it cannot be formed from a strong acid or a strong base okay let me illustrate to you examples okay uh, let me choose a color that is quite clear over here okay i'll put it as a white okay let's have what is example of a weak acid so a weak acid is hf okay so hf will dissociate into h plus plus f minus right so hf is the acid the conjugate base is the f minus okay f minus so how do you want to form a salt from the conjugate base okay it's because the definition of a, a buffer is a weak acid plus is the salt of its conjugate base okay uh, or oh, it doesn't stay over here okay a weak acid it must be a weak acid plus the salt of its conjugate base so right now hf plus f minus so con this is the conjugate base how do we form salt from the conjugate base and another an ion uh, cation so na plus so you add na plus over here so it become a salt okay so this will be the salt of the conjugate base so what then is a buffer i write it uh, above hf plus n a f okay so this is how we form a buffer hf this weak acid and then the salt of the conjugate base the conjugate base is f minus to know the salt is just you add the any 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 cation from group one naf so you form a salt so the whole buffer is hf plus naf so again i remind you this is the acid and this is naf is salt of the conjugate base now what happens when you add an acid so you add an acid it will react with the base what happens when you add a base it will react with the acid so for this buffer solution of hf plus naf when you add an a base it will react with the acid components of the buffer when you add an acid it will react with the base of the component okay so this is how a buffer works so to summarize it a buffer consists of a weak acid and its conjugate base sorry a weak acid and the salt of its conjugate base or it consists of a weak base and a salt the salt of its conjugate acid okay ch3cooh or oh, that is also acid uh, okay so I'll, the example given somewhere else name. okay so this is how we define by buffers example of the uh, calculation for a uh, buffer solution so the buffer is hf and the salt of its conjugate base sodium fluoride 
So the concentration is 0.01 molar HF and then 0.50 molar sodium chloride. Okay, so these are the calculations. If you look over HF, 0. Uh, using the Ka just now, okay, then x equal to uh, minus 0.010 o minus x, 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 and then in the same time, the salt sodium chloride will also contribute the concentration of uh, the the F. Okay, 0 0.50. So when you insert into the equation, Ka equal to 3.5 times 10 minus 4. That's the Ka for for uh, for HF. Then X. Okay, X is uh, sodium, and then the F, X plus 0 0.50 divide by 0 0.010 minus F. From there we got it. X equal to 10.7.0, 10, 10 minus 6, and the pH is 5.5, meaning that the pH of this buffer solution is 5.5. Okay, a simple calculation of how we calculate the buffer solution, similar to a calculation for the acid, except that now there's a contribution from F minus. Okay. Now we'll go over uh, top what we call as a volumetric analysis in terms of the acid base titration. Okay, when we titrate acid and a base, and two examples will be made uh, strong acid and strong base uh, titration, and weak acid and strong base titration. Okay, what are acid base titration? I think uh, we already um, common with it. An acid and base being reacted and since it's a titration so we use a burette and the conical plus and when it's a strong strong acid so it will yield a sharper end point what does that mean uh, a small change in the volume of the titrant will produce a very large change in the pH whereas for weak acid or weak base when we are making it so we'll see that uh, the change is quite small it's not that sharp as compared to for a strong acid i think the diagram will illustrate better okay example and application of acid based titration so many biological uh, samples and in the palm oil titration so there's a lot of acid based titration still being carried out in the uh, in the industries a lot a lot and it's worse for us to to look at how titration are being made so this is what meant by a sharp a sharp titration okay a sharp peak so if you observe again okay so this is what meant sharp so so a small change of volume over here, it will produce a large change in the pH. Okay, so this amount of pH change occurs uh, with a small change of titrant volume at the pH, at the, uh, at the end point. Okay, and for strong base and strong acid, it will have the equivalence point at pH 7.0. Every titration, it can be differentiated by four regions. The first one is pH of the starting solution. Second one is P before the equivalence point, uh, at the equivalence point, and then after the equivalence point. Let me elaborate a little bit. Okay, pH of the starting solution. Now, uh, when we are measuring the pH, we are measuring pH in the conical plus. So, if the titrant is a base, then the conical plus consists of an acid. If the titrant is an acid, then the, tit uh, the conical plus consists of a base. So, depending on 
uh, which are being titrated. Okay, so that will determine our starting point. So before the equivalence point, so before the equivalence point, so uh, we make we may know it by adding a small amount of the titrant, so it won't reach the equivalent point. At the equivalent point, the production of uh, a salt, totally salt, all analyte had been reacted, so only a salt. And beyond the equivalent point, one drop of extra titrant. Okay, so when we are done with that, uh, the equivalent point, so the next drop of titrant will react with the indicator showing a change in color. Only one drop excess of the equivalence point. Okay, let's put the example by titrating 50 ml of HBr and we titrate that with 0.2 molar of uh, KOH. Okay. So we would add uh, 10 ml, 25 ml. So we know that at 25 ml, uh, it would be the equivalence point. And 30 ml, I don't think so. It should be 30 ml. It should be 25.10. But okay, put it just 30 for the sake of showing off. But that shouldn't be the volume. It should be one drop. One drop of titran is 0 0.05. So it should be 25.05 or at most 25.1 should be the calculation. But just for the sake of calculation, look at it, okay? Okay, the initial pH, I think the example given are uh, more difficult. I think this is the simple calculation. Okay, this is the simple calculation. So what is the uh, initial pH? initial um, molarity is 0.10 okay because it's only contain strong acid so 50 times so when we add uh, 10 ml of sodium hydroxide so let's put the calculation again so 50 ml times 0 0.01 of the initial HBr, so we would have a 5.0 millimole. So if you look back, 0 0.1 mole per liter, per liter is equivalent to 0 0.1 mole millimole per milliliter. So we add the milli. Okay, mole per liter convert to millimole per liter, so it's the same unit for the molarity. Okay, so there is 5 m. Uh, 5 millimole. If you can can remember this one is uh, molarity equal to mole per liter. So they they check for the initial H plus. Okay, so this is the calculation. Okay, OH minus added. So how much? Uh, 10 ml times 0 0.2, meaning that there are 2 millimole of uh, base are being added. Okay, so the amount of excess acid 5 minus the two base being added so all the acid uh, base added will react with the acid so now we are left with 3.0 millimole of acid now the volume had already changed originally is 50 ml but we add the 10 ml of base so the total volume is 60 ml so what's then the new molarity 3 millimole divided by 60 ml so it is 0 0.05 molar Okay, so the pH minus log, the molarity of H plus, 0 0.05, and we get the pH now at 1.30. So when we add a base, so the pH jump from 1.0 to 1.30, just a slight increase. After the addition of 25 ml of strong base, so we'll see that when we calculate the amount of the original acid, so 5.0 millimole, and the amount of base added, 5.0 millimole. So at this point, this is the equivalence point. So there is no excess of acid, though there is no excess of the titran. For a strong acid and a strong base, the pH will be 7. 
So y, the same amount of h plus and OH minus 10 minus 14. And then calculate the H plus and the OH minus. So the pH will be 7. Only for strong acid and the strong base, the pH at equivalence point will be 7. Okay, this is the condition in which we are now beyond the equivalence point. And if you are a good chemist doing the titration very carefully, you would add an excess one drop of the titrate. So one drop of titrant using a burette, it will give you around 0.05. That's why the calculation put in 25.05 ml of strong base. So right now the initial acid is 5 and then you already added 5.01 millimole of the base. So there will be an excess millimole of base, one drop. So what does this one drop uh, occur? It will react with the indicator. Okay, that one drop will react with the indicator and it will change the indicator color from uh, its color in acid to its color in base. So this is the end point. One drop in excess uh, of the volume in equivalence point. Okay, and point one drop in excess. So right now uh, you have the excess is 0.01 mole and then there will be 75.05 uh, milliliter and you get the molarity of the base added, extra uh, added, the one drop is 1.33 times 10 minus 4 and you calculate the OH minus to be 3.88 and you calculate the pH 14 minus 3.88, 10.12. So this is the end point and the end point occurs at pH 10.12. Now look at the huge jump in the pH value. With one drop, it increases from the equivalence point at pH 7 to pH 10.12. 3.12 increase in the pH value with one drop. So that is what we call as a characteristic of an acid or a base a titration okay a huge jump in the pH value with a small increment of the titrate we'll go now to the second one is the titration of a weak acid with a strong base so we replace the HBr now with a weak acid okay We'll go now to the second one, is the titration of a weak acid uh, with a strong base. So we replace the HBr now with a weak acid. Okay. Uh, the same, the same, the same uh, region would be discussed. pH of the starting solution before the equivalence point. The, end, the only exception uh, before the equivalence point at the equivalence point and after the equivalence point. Now, this is interesting actually. Okay, this is interesting. Let me elaborate. So, when we are starting the, uh, the calculation, we are starting the calculation for the weak acid. For the weak acid, because we are start, uh, using a weak acid again, the titrant, a strong base. So, right now we are calculating for the weak acid. Okay. So that's the first region. The second region, when we already add a base, so what happens? When the base added to the acid, it will produce salt. It will produce salt. So in the solution right now, you will have your original weak acid and the salt. And if you can remember what is the definition of a buffer, buffer is the presence of a weak acid and salt of its conjugate base. So actually, before the equivalence point in this type of titration, is a buffer solution. And the calculation is based on the calculation for buffer solution. Okay. Now, at the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, if it is a strong acid with a strong base, the pH will be 7. But over here is a weak acid. 
and a strong base. So we would expect that the pH is not 7. So the pH goes to which is stronger. So since the uh, base is stronger, a strong base, so the pH is likely to be more than 7. Okay. So when we, uh, the pH is calculated right now based on the concentration of the salt. So what is the salt being formed? For example, I just put example. If this, it is titration of acetic acid with sodium hydroxide, so acetic acid dissociate to form acetate. So that is the conjugate base. And we add the sodium. Sodium acetate is the salt. So when we make uh, the calculation later on, so it's based on the hydrolysis of the salt. Sodium acetate. Now let me put a point. Please listen. So sodium acetate consists of two parts, sodium and acetate. So for sodium, it is uh, the cation of a strong uh, a strong base. Okay, originally it come from sodium hydroxide. So for a strong base or a strong acid, it will not hydrolyze. Mean that there will be no changes in pH when it react with water. Okay, but but for a weak base, for a weak uh, for a weak uh, Na plus just now, and then the CH three COO minus. So that is its conjugate base of the acid. So it will hydrolyze. Okay, it will hydrolyze. So in the hydrolysis of the conjugate base, it will produce OH- in solution. And this is why uh, the, the equivalence point will be more than 7 because of the presence of OH- produced by the reaction of the conjugate base with water. I will discuss this further during the calculation. After the equivalence point, so after the equivalence point, all uh, all the weak acid is already exhausted, finished reacting. So we would be uh, have the concentration of a strong base, and calculation is based on calculation of the strong pH of the strong base. So if you look in this type of titration, it's very interesting why all types of calculation is involved. Uh, the first one, the first region is calculation of a weak acid. The second uh, is calculation for a buffer solution. The third one, calculation of hydrolysis of the salt. And the fourth one, calculation of a strong base. Very good examples of us trying, having to have the understanding of calculation for all types of calculation for weak, uh, for, for uh, acid and base. Okay, this is the influence of the Ka values of weak acid on the shape of the titration curves. So when we calculated HBr just now, okay, so this is, uh, I changed to it, it will have a very low pH and a very sharp inflection point. When we have a very, we have a weak acid, look at the difference. I'll put in yellow. It will have a higher inflection point, a higher, sorry, higher pH. And then it will have, uh, so if you see the curve over here, okay, the curve over here. So when it increases, it will increase more gradually. It's not as sharp as uh, a strong acid. So this differentiate uh, a weak acid. First, if the pH is higher, the second in terms of the inflection here, when it goes up, it will go up gradually. It's not a sharp, sharp over here as compared to a strong acid. We go to the titration, example of titration of acetic acid. 
with Ka is 2.1 times 10 minus 6. So acetic acid is weak acid. And then we'll go for uh, sodium hydroxide as the titrant. So NOH is a strong base. So we'll calculate it uh, at the four region, similar to the four region before the titration, after the addition of 10 ml sodium hydroxide at the equivalent point. And then after the addition of one drop of sodium hydroxide beyond the equivalent point, the end point, so a change in color, so the increase in pH. Okay, the first one, initial pH. So you have in your conical plus is acetic acid. So the calculation involves calculating the pH of 0 0.10 molar acetic acid. And this is the same exercise that we uh, calculated last time. So similar exercise. So uh, using the Ka and put in the X and the X is the H3O plus. Okay. So you calculate the pH of minus log of 4.58. 10 minus 4, that is the concentration of the H plus that you obtain. So you'll get the pH at 3.34. So look at the pH. For a weak acid, the pH is much higher comparatively to a strong acid. We use HBr just now is pH 1.0. So that is the pH of a strong acid, the same concentration, 0 0.10 molar, but the pH would be 1.0, whereas for a weak acid, the pH would be 3.34 okay so this is the initial pH of the solution and then we'll add a certain amount of sodium hydroxide now I'm not sure uh, the calculation let me try to explain it if you can understand it very well based on your previous lesson okay previous lesson in metric class e. you add sodium hydroxide to a buffer solution. Right now, it's a buffer solution. It will form a buffer solution. So you are now calculating the pH of a buffer solution. Okay. Now, what is the amount of sodium hydroxide added? You add 10 ml. 10 ml times 0 0.1. So this is the uh, the millimole. It doesn't calculate. So this is the amount or the millimole of uh, sodium hydroxide added okay now every time the hydroxide is added it will react with your acid okay because it's a base sodium hydroxide added is a base so it will react in the combination of your acid so your acid is CH3COOH and it will form a salt so the amount of sodium hydroxide added is similar is the same to the amount of salt being formed okay so this is what is meant sodium hydroxide added equivalent to the amount of salt being formed okay so we we'll calculate it and then get the molarity the molarity right now is uh, the volume is 40 because originally is 30 30 plus 10 so you get uh, so you did this divide by 40 and you'll get this is the concentration of your salt okay uh, let me repeat it for you okay a buffer solution okay it consists of consists of a base okay uh, or in this case an acid acid is weak acid and is salt of its conjugate base so how does the salt form when we add sodium hydroxide to a weak acid containing CH3COOH, so it will react to, to form acetate, sodium acetate. So what is the concentration of the acetate? You time based on what is the amount of salt, uh, sodium hydroxide being added, 10 times 0 0.1, divide by the new volume. The new volume is 30 plus 10, so you get the concentration of the salt is 0 0.025. Now, Look at the concentration of the acetic acid just now. So it's 3.0. If you can remember, when we add the sodium hydroxide, it will react with the acetic acid. So what happens to the concentration of the acetic acid will be reduced. And the salt concentration will increase. So when we add base, it will react with the acid. 
so the acid concentration will be reduced and the salt will increase okay now not in this question what about if i were to add a base so the base will react with the uh, sorry what about if i add an acid the acid will react with the base that is the salt so what happened to the salt it will reduce in concentration how much depending on how much acid are being added so what happens to the concentration of the acid the acid will increase how much depending upon how much of the uh, acid is being added so the same amount of acid being added that is the formation of the salt and that will be the same amount of acid will that will increase okay you add acid the salt will decrease the amount of acid will increase you add a base the acid will decrease and the amount of salt will increase so in this case you add the base so when you add the base how much base one molar okay one millimole so what is the amount of acid left originally 3.0 minus 1 so this is the amount of acid left okay when we make into concentration okay the concentration is 0 0.050 so we put into the equation so this is the salt and this is the acid so the salt is 0 0.025 the acid is 0 0.050 so you'll get the concentration of h3o plus and then the ph of 5.38 okay so this is how we calculate after addition of uh, 10 ml of sodium hydroxide a buffer solution is formed and we calculate the ph of a buffer solution alternatively buffer can be calculated much easier simpler by putting in what we call as the henderson hasselbeck equation so henderson hasselbeck equation is ph equal to pka plus log of the concentration of the acid divide by the concentration of the salt uh, log of concentration of acid by divide by the salt okay so this is how the calculation goes so this is the concentration of the acid and this is the concentration of the salt and you'll get the similar answer 5.38 So your choice whether to use this equation which is for me is simpler or use the previous type of calculation okay this is uh, at the equivalence point so at the equivalence point mole of acid equal to mole of base okay now uh, when we titrate strong acid and strong base we do not have to calculate the equivalence point pH at equivalence point because it's certainly to be 7 but when we are calculating a strong acid and a weak base okay strong acid and a weak base so we'll go to the stronger component so it seems a strong acid so we expect the equivalence point to be less than 7 but in this case we are titrating acetic acid a weak acid and a strong base sodium hydroxide so we expect the equivalence point to be more than 7 because of the strong base secondly what happens and this is explain what the term as hydrolysis and this is we call it as uh, anion hydrolysis when the salt form is acetate uh, sodium acetate so when sodium acetate uh, dissolve in water or dissociate in water it will form Na plus and it will form acetate sodium plus would not react with water no hydrolysis but acetate will react with water and in this reaction it will produce OH minus okay it will produce OH minus so the whole equation is we call this as the hydrolysis equation and this we term as anion hydrolysis because CH3COO minus undergo the process of hydrolysis okay 
hydrolysis, so anion hydrolysis will produce OH minus. So that's the reason why the pH is more than 7. Okay, now we make the calculation. Okay, so right now, you are given just now is acid, right? If you look over here, it put the term KB, which I, I actually, I don't like it. For me, I would put it as KH. Uh, I, can I write it over here? KH equal to KW over KA. Okay, just to reflect that KH is hydrolysis equation, not dissociation constant of the base. But instead, this equation, okay, the equation that we are describing, these are uh, hydrolysis equation and we are describing it. See, it's the same formula, KW over KA equal to KB, but this one, I write this as KH, hydrolysis equation. Okay, so we put in the values, put in the values, and next page, slide. Okay, we put, put in the values and we got the, calculate the, the value of OH minus 2.18 times 10 minus 5. And we calculate the POH 4.66 and the pH to be 9.34. Look at the concentration. So at equivalence point, the pH is more than 7. Why? During the anion hydrolysis, it will contribute OH minus to the solution. That's why it is pH 7, more than pH 7. When we calculate it, the calculation shows that the pH occurs at, uh, the equivalence point occurs at pH 9.34. Now look at the pH right now for pH above the uh, uh, equivalence point, that is the end point after one drop of your titrant are being added. So after the addition of 30.05 milliliter of sodium hydroxide. So all your initial acetic acid is already reacted. Okay, it's already reacted. So we are now left with excess of uh, excess of your your titrate. So if you make the calculation, 30.05 okay times 0 0.1. So Okay, so, so this one, 30 point time, minus 30.0, so this is the amount in excess. Okay, so the volume now is 60.05, 30 plus 30.05, and when you calculate it, the amount of concentration of sodium in excess is 8.32 times 10 minus 5 molar. So we'll calculate the pH to be for POH, sorry. To be 4.1 and then the pH to be 9.92. So it increases the pH from equivalence point 9.34 and further one drop it will be 9.92. So this is characteristic of what we call as uh, the uh, end point. Okay, what's the pH at end point? One drop after the equivalence point. Okay, so we are done with calculation of the titration between a weak acid and a strong base. So you will have to know the calculation for a weak acid, for a buffer solution, hydrolysis equation for the salt, and also pH of a strong acid. And if we look at the titration curve, so these are the titration curve. So where is the uh, equivalent point, nine point, Three, four, and then uh, which is the pH just above the uh, end, uh, equivalent point that is the end point I think it's around over here okay around over here it should be around over here so this value 9.92 should be around here okay acid base indicators so what the function of the indicators to show the endpoint, okay. To show the endpoint, 
So the indicator chance changes color over the pH range. So if it is the originally the color of acid, it will change over to the color of uh, base whenever that extra titrant react with the indicator. Or when it is initially in the color of base, so it will change to the color of acid. Okay. Uh, an acid indicator for change from acid color to a base color, from a base color to an acid color. So that, that's it. The equilibrium expression for the acidic and basic indicators are as follows. So I think there is nothing much different as comparatively to what we have uh, discussed about KE and KB. Okay, and these are the selection. Now, what I want you to observe something. If you have phenolphthalein, for example, the color change from colorless to uh, red or pink, whatever it is, the color. So colorless from colorless to red is a very clear changes. It's a very clear change. Okay, but compared to some other some other color changes, for example, yellow to blue, for example, over here, the color can be observed, but you have to look it more closely. So that, these are the examples of good, good indicators. But again, some indicators are better in showing the difference in color in acid and base. Some are not. Okay, but these are the range. So if you look the range, so these are the range in which the endpoint must occur over here. Let's look for example 9.34 just now. 9.34 is the uh, endpoint for acetic acid and and uh, sodium hydroxide. So 9.34 probably we can use phenolphthalein or probably probably 9.4 is 9.34 thymolphthalein. Okay. So certainly we can use phenolphthalein or we can also use thymolphthalein as the indicator as long as the endpoint is located in within the range. We'll go now to the second type of precipitation, uh, uh, second type of titration, which is called precipitation titration. So similar to what we call as the gravimetry, instead right now we are using titration, okay? So based on reaction, the yield ionic compounds of low solubility, the crystal. Analyte is titrated with a standard solution of a precipitating agent. In gravimetry, we add it. But over here, we are titrating it. So the Ag plus as the pre precipitating agent, we are now titrating it. And then there is the detection of endpoint, the indicator. Okay. In argonthometric titration, meaning that we are using silver nitrate as the precipitating agent. So any, uh, whenever silver can react with any analyte and form an insoluble precipitate or sol sparingly soluble precipitate, then it can be used in an argonthometric titration. Okay, so the requirement is say that Precipitate formation must be stoichiometric. It has the ratio, the same ratio. Okay. Rapid equilibrium between precipitate and ion. So immediately occurs the equilibrium. It won't take a long time to achieve equilibrium. Otherwise, we have to wait. The precipitate is of low solubility, so the SP is low. And a method to detect the stoichiometric point of the titration. I think a uh, stoichiometric point of titration, once one drop beyond the stoichiometric point of titration, we are not trying to detect the equivalence point, but to, to detect one drop after the equivalence point, the end point. So when we know the end point, certainly we will know the equivalence point. So end point, I think the setup is almost the same. Okay, but in this uh, technique that we will be discussing, it uses an indicator uh, based on chemical method, okay, chemical reactions. 
because it says that over there chemical method still give accurate result some other new instrumentation they use as what we call as ISE ion selective electrode when we immerse that electrode in the solution it will detect how much if of iron our ions are in that so it's very easy compared to titration so we immerse it the ion selective electrode it will be very selective to our ions of interest and it will uh, give us the millivolt the, the reading of it that is an option but not the one that we are discussing we are discussing about the titration Okay, the problem of uh, precipitation titration is to find the endpoint. So we would discuss uh, quite detail, I think, about three of the methods being used to detect the endpoint: the Mohr method, Fajans method, and the Volhard method. Uh, somehow we would not uh, plot the curve. Okay, in this we will not plot the curve. So we can plot the curve by the potentiometric uh, method, measure the potential of silver electrode. So we would not do this in the experiment and we will not uh, discuss this further. So we would only uh, discuss about the indicators used in the form of chemical methods. Okay, precipitation titration indicators, how does it work? So similar to all our uh, titration, okay, titrometry. So when we have a titrant in the burette and we have the analyte, and the indicator in the conical flask. So when we make the initial titration, all the titrants will react with our analyte. So if A is the analyte, R the titrating agent, and IN is the indicator, so we would see at the initial part of the uh, titration, the A analyte will react with the R the titrating agent up to a point in which we achieve the equivalence point. At equivalence point, all our analyte had reacted with the titrating agent. And beyond that, in the end point, end point occurs when the next drop of titrating agent would react with our indicator. So that indicator will change from a one color to another color when the reacting titrant uh, the titrant added will react with the indicator so in more method is based on the formation of colored precipitate again or Bohat method is based on the formation of soluble color uh, complex and Fajan's method based on the absorption of indicator on the precipitate okay let's discuss about the titration So, uh, in more method, now we are discussing, uh, discussing about uh, the indicators. Okay, a direct method for chloride determination based on the formation of secondary precipitate or more to detect the end point. Let's uh, put it. So, when AG plus CL, A plus, so this is our, uh, our analyte and this is our titrant and this is our product. So, AGCL is our product. Okay. So at end point, chromate is the, we add in the conical flask chromate. So chromate in the indicator. So we expect that one drop of our AG plus, the titrant, will react with chromate producing argentum chromate. And it will give you a brick red color showing that that is the end point. Okay. So at the equivalence point, uh, if we calculate it, 1.8 and 10 minus 10, the solubility of Ag plus or solubility of chloride should be 1.34 times 10 minus 5. So that is the equivalence point. Is there any color changes? No at the equivalence point. But then we would have to need one drop bigger than 1.34 times 10 minus 5 molar and then only the formation of uh, argentum chromate and the red color will be visible okay so these are examples of the color i think you can observe it the color and the light and then the red color 
Okay, condition and sources of error. Uh, let me write first. If you can see it, okay, KSP equal to EG plus uh, and then CRO4 2 minus. So EG plus there is a squared over here. Okay. Hmm, you can see it. Okay, that is the KSP for the indicator. So the first one must run a blank to determine how much to over titrate. Uh, so we'll just take the value. So it will work best actually at 2.5 10 minus 3 molar of uh, amount of uh, dichromate that is easily visible. Okay. pH must be neutral to slightly basic to prevent error. Okay. So we must work during the titration. We must work within pH 7 to 10. Now what happens when we work below 10 or above, sorry, above 10 or below 7. Okay. What happens is says that at pH above 10, so above 10, there will be a lot of hydroxide inside the solution. So that hydroxide will react with AG plus formation of AGOH. Meaning that when we add the AG plus, it has the option to react with chromate, the indicator, or to react with OH minus. And I strongly believe, without stating it over here, the AGOH will have a lower KSP value. So that's the reason why when there is OH minus, there is chromate, it will react first with OH minus, the formation of AGOH. So what happens? The AGOH did not react with the chromate and thus the red color will not be happening. Instead, it will react with OH- until OH- will be finished, then only it will react with the chromate and produce that red color. So what happens? The amount of AD plus that had to be titrated will be more than before. So there will be an error because of the OH- excess AD plus had to be titrated. So this is a problem at pH bigger than 10. At pH less than 10, okay, at pH less than 10, H plus will react with the chromate, the indicator, formation of HRO4 minus. So what happens, the concentration of chromate will reduce. So if I put it, so when the chromate concentration is reduced, so what happens? To achieve the same value of KSP, the amount of AG plus that you need to add or titrate will be more. Okay, so that is the error. I repeat myself. At pH less than 7, there will be H plus. And H plus will have a preferential reaction with chromate as compared to argentum, uh, silver. So it will react with the chromate formation of HCRO4 minus and the concentration of the chromate will be reduced. Okay, will be reduced. Therefore, to achieve this KSP, so since the concentration of chromate is reduced, you must add a lot more of the silver to achieve the value of KSP or more than KSP so that it will uh, change in color. It will precipitate out and change in color. So this is what we call uh, as error. If we were to titrate it at less than 10, less than 7, sorry, sorry, less than 7 or more than 10. So it must work best between pH 7 to Okay, what is the uh, concentration of chromate that you will uh, insert into your conical flask? 
to be the titrant. So this is basically uh, what, what the calculation is about. So you have the KSP of AGCL to be 1.82, 10, 10, minus 10. So at equivalence point, okay, the concentration of AG plus would be 1.34, 10, 10, minus 5. Concentration of CL minus also 1.34, 10, 10, minus 5. Okay. So in the formation of the precipitate uh, of the indicator, so it has KSP uh, agantum chromate, KSP of 1.1, 1 .1, 10, 10, minus 12. So you will look and put into the equation, Okay, you will calculate that the chromate concentration would be 6.03 10 10 minus 3 to achieve the KSP. Okay, so we need this concentration of chromate so that it will change color after a slightly more than concentration, change color at the end point. Now, can we add 6.03 10 10 minus 3? It should be, but then it says that since chromate is yellow and it will mask the red precipitate we cannot see it clearly so that's why it says that the concentration suggested as in the last slide 2.5 times 10 minus 3 so actually we would uh, in the titration itself we would have to add more ag plus because the concentration of the chromate is lower so we have to have a higher concentration of ag plus but since we do it uh, for every sample, we normalize the, the error or the changes. The second option of the uh, type as indicator is the Volhard method. So it is a back titration okay, for determination of chloride using silver as the titan. And uh, let me let me explain uh, the example. Okay, what do we do in the back titration? We had an excess silver, meaning that what is meant by excess, we add an, a concentration of silver more than what is needed to precipitate all Cl minus. So this must be in excess. Okay, it must be in excess, and it will react with the analyte chloride and formation of the precipitate. And this is the concentration of Ag plus in excess. And then we would titrate Ag plus with thiocyanate. Okay. And it will form this one. And in the titration, we would use FET plus as the indicator. And in the titration, in the titration, we use thiocyanate as a titrant. It will react with the indicator formation of a red, red color. Fe, SCN, 2 plus. It's a complex. So Fe, SCN complex. So the end point is uh, red in color. Okay. So this is a back titration. So I repeat it as I uh, told you last time. So if you want to buy a pen, you don't know what's the price, so you give 10 ringgit and then, so this is the 10 ringgit, okay, the 10 ringgit, and then you don't know what is, uh, the shopkeeper will return to you 4 ringgit, okay, will use 4 ringgit. So you know now what is the excess, so this is 4 ringgit and this is 10. So how much of, uh, what is the cost of your pen? 10 minus 4. So it's six ringgit. So similarly, by knowing the concentration that you add in excess, and then by titrating and knowing the concentration of Ag plus in excess, so you minus uh, the from the original concentration, you will know the concentration that react with the chloride. Okay, so this is example of a back titration. Uh, these are what being described just now. So ADCL will form the precipitate, okay, and then the excess AG plus will be titrated again, thiocyanate, uh, okay, and then it will form this precipitate. So by by uh, when at end point, so the excess titrant, this is the titrant, will react with the indicator. So this is the indicator formation of FeSCN2 plus complex which is red in color
Okay, conditions and sources of error. So the red FE SEN2 plus compact color is detectable at 6.4 times 10 minus 6 molar. A low concentration, good enough. Titration must also be done in acidic pH. Okay, to prevent precipitation of our indicator. FE3 plus is our indicator. So at high, cons uh, high pH, it may react with the hydroxide and be uh, precipitated out. So we would have certainly have an error. Okay, if the concentration of Fe3 plus is being reduced. Okay, so that's the first condition. Do it in acidic pH. The second condition, when we add the original uh, Ag plus in high concentration and it reacts with the Cl minus formation of the precipitate, we must remove the precipitate first before titrating uh, to determine the excess Ag plus using SCN minus thiocyanate. Okay, we must precipitate it first. Uh, sorry, uh, filter it first. Remove the AgCl. Or we can mask the uh, AgCl by putting in nitrobenzene where it forms an oily layer preventing its reaction with thiocyanate. What happens when we do not remove the precipitated AGCL? Okay, let me explain. So, uh, assume that this is the AG+, plus, which is in excess. And we would titrate this with SCN-, minus, the formation of AGSCN. Okay, and then with the Fe3+, plus as the indicator. So, what happens? Okay, what happens? When this Ag plus are being titrated, what happened to the concentration of this Ag plus will be reduced, right? Okay, the concentration in solution will be reduced. Now, there is a second source of uh, Ag plus that is from the precipitated AgCl. So, Lechatelier principle says that if the concentration of Ag plus is reduced, so what happens? The reaction will move towards the left, in this case, to produce more Ag plus. So when you titrate the Ag plus, the excess Ag plus actually, okay, but there is a contribution beside the excess Ag plus, there is also the Ag plus from dissociation of AgCl. So when the concentration of excess Ag plus and the associated Ag plus is being reduced, what happens? It will produce more Ag plus, more Ag plus. So, so you would see that the amount of precipitate as you run your titration will continuously be reduced because the AgCl will redissolve to produce AgCl. So what happens to the amount of SCN- minus used for titration? The amount will be a lot. And that is the source of error. So the error will come from the Ag plus being added to the solution uh, through the dissociation of AgCl. So that's why the precipitated AgCl must be removed prior to titration. Otherwise, uh, a lot of the volume of SCN will be a lot before uh, the FESCN formation of FESCN indicator showing, showing the endpoint. Okay, so ADCL must be removed first. Okay, the Fajans method, the third method, the third indicator we use, what we call as a Fajans method, is an absorption indicator. The change in color occurs when the indicator absorbs onto the precipitate, changing in color from green to red. Okay, similarly, Ag plus or AgNO3 is used as the standard solution, as the precipitant. You titrate it with Ag plus. And the absorption indicator is DCF, or we call it uh, easily as fluorescein. And the endpoint occurs on the surface of the AgCl precipitate. So initially, when you uh, titrate in Ag plus, it will form AgCl. Okay, so this is the AgCl. So in free form, meaning that on absorb without the absorb uh, without being absorbed onto the precipitate in free form, the indicator will have a green color. Okay, 
Now, what happens uh, at end point? Okay, end point. So, AG plus would be absorbed onto the precipitate. AG plus would be absorbed on the, onto the precipitate. And since it is positive charge, so indicator which is negative charge, it will be attracted to AG plus and absorbed together with the AG plus. So when it absorbs, the color changes from green to red. So this is what meant by the Fajans method. So this is the uh, Fajans method. So again, the color changes whether it's in free form or whether it's in uh, red uh, absorb form, which is red. So the green color and the red color in absorb form. Let's put it uh, how it's being uh, how it happened. You are titrating AG plus plus Cl minus. So during this titration, AgCl are formed, and chloride, which is your analyte, are still present on the surface of the on the uh, AgCl. Okay, because there are the Cl minus is not totally being titrated. So there will be excess Cl minus. So again, if you can remember, what is the charge on the fluorescein? Minus. Cl minus is minus. So it will repel the indicator. So the indicator cannot be absorbed onto the surface of the uh, AgCl. At, at uh, equivalent point, so all the Cl minus had already formed precipitate. Now what happens at the end point? So Ag plus will absorb and be on the primary layer. Okay, absorb onto the surface of the indicator uh, on the precipitate. So Ag plus is plus charge. Fluorescein is negatively charged. So that F plus and negative charge will have an electrostatic attraction so the chlorophyll will be attracted to the ag plus and be absorbed onto the surface of the precipitate when in absorb form it will change color from green to red so basically uh, this is what happens so again uh, this is the description at equivalence point equivalence point though so there is no more uh, no more Cl minus to repel the Ag plus, uh, to repel the uh, fluorocyl F minus. Okay, but beyond the equivalence point, at the end point, Ag plus will be absorbed and it will pull in the indicator to form the red color. The red color or the pink color, the pink color. So this is the Fajans method. Okay, from green to the end point. So this is quite a distinct color change. Uh, it's summarized again. Okay, it's summarized again. So before equivalence point, you can observe that chloride is being absorbed onto the surface. So at equivalent, there is no chloride, there is no AD plus. And then at after equivalent at the end point, so there will be AG plus and this AG plus will pull in the fluorescein to form the AG plus fluorescein. Okay, and it will turn the color from green in free form to red when it is absorbed onto the surface. Okay, finally, the volumetric analysis based on complexometric titration complex formation titration and it's similar to your laboratory uh, lab assignment that you did in the lab titration of uh, hardness of water to test for the hardness of water using EDTA so EDTA will form correction compound with most metals and that's why it's a very good compacting agent for metals and can be used for determination of the concentration of metals based on EDTA now this is EDTA, so if you look at EDTA depending on the pH, at higher pH, okay, uh, this one will become minus, O minus, O minus, O minus, O minus, 
k this one o minus and o minus for all the h put h plus will be deprotonated at higher ph at low ph it will have that h plus so depending on the ph so that's why given all the value of the ka okay so we expect that when it has in the form of hy3 minus it must be a high ph so ph uh, high ph because the ka now is 5.50 times 10 minus 11 now important thing k edta will always combine with metals in one to one ratio okay one to one ratio if you look examples over here if it is a divalent compound is still in one to one ratio uh, monovalent sorry this is divalent still one to one ratio and then trivalent also in one to one ratio the only difference is the number of charge monovalent divalent and trivalent the type of compact being formed but it's always a one to one ratio and this is the formation constants of complex okay the higher is the value the stronger is the bonding so this examples of metal edta complex and we can use the edta for titrating and in the lab, if you can remember it, you are using aerochrome black tea as the indicator, okay, for determination of water hardness. Okay, the DA titration indicators, we can use colorimetric indicators, but we would uh, discuss or look at the structure of aerochrome black tea, a metal ion indicator. So this is, uh, so this is uh, aerochrome black tea. When uh ebt okay alone it will be in blue color but when you put in your metal analyte it will combine with metal and with a color of red okay so now edta is added and the metal ion initially formed with uh aerochrome black tea will form complexes with the edta preferentially because it forms a stronger complex so it will form complexes with the eta instead of the ebt okay and then it will give you a blue color so when it is ebt metals it's red in color but when it is uh, metals and edta will change to blue color so we expect the uh, the color will change from red to blue at end point okay users of edta so we'll go over to uh, the only one that we will discuss that is complexation of calcium and magnesium for reduction of water hardness okay these are the example of the calculation determination of water hardness 100 ml drinking water treated with buffer at ph of 10 calmagite indicator was added or not EBT okay a calmagite indicator was added and the solution titrated with EDTA so 25 23.5 ml of the titrant was required to achieve the endpoint calculate the water hardness in terms of ppm ca co3 so again we remind you it's easy because it involves a one to one okay one to one complex formation so molar of calcium volume of sample equal to molar of edta volume of edta okay so molar of edta given volume of edta given so meaning that if we can calculate how much edta is being used or how many moles of edta equal to the moles of calcium actually okay so we put in the the values and we got it as 117.6 ppm in the calculation it gives you 1.175 times mole per liter so what do you do convert this to ppm okay so this is how we get it 117.6 ppm an easy calculation the alternative an alternative answer how do we calculate the calcium and edta so right now uh, we know that is one mole of 
calcium will react with one mole of EDTA. So by calculating the millimole of EDTA, we can calculate the millimole of calcium. So EDTA 0 0.0050 times 23.5 and we get the millimole. And to get that into milligram times it by the formula weight, we get 11.76 milligram. But we are making only in one liter. So we got it, divide it by 100 ml or 0 0.1 liter and we get it 117.6 ppm. So the water hardness is 117 and we compared, we got it that the water hardness is medium. Okay, so this is the alternative calculation for determination of uh, calcium and this same technique of calculating you can carry out in the lab. Okay, the lab, the lab answer should be similar to this. Okay, by this slide, we end the, uh, the topic voltammetry, uh, volumetry, and also we'll end the topic of our class, the whole class, and by this uh, slide. So thank you very much for your attentiveness and for your involvement in the teaching. So again, I thought that this would be my last semester teaching of teaching and trying to put in my best face in it trying to put in my best effort in it, somehow it changes. So my first 35 years of teaching, this is my first time of teaching through uh, recording my voice. So my English is not as good as my Malay. So I just hope you can understand it very well. Although the proficiency is not, there's a lot of E, R. Mm, <laughs> sorry for that, so, really sorry for that. I do not have the good proficiency in English, but I think it's enough for you to understand what is being delivered. So thank you very much for being attentive, for giving me the support and putting in the commitment and the involvement in the teaching process. I really hope that you could understand uh, what are being presented and I really wish you could uh, answer all the questions and obtain a good grade in your study. So. Stay home, stay safe, uh, hopefully we will meet somewhere, okay, in the final exam, okay, and then we'll meet somewhere uh, in the program of roadmap of faculty science or other places that uh, so as to appreciate one another. Okay, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera.